Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You probably know the accepted definition of a mathematician as a person who talks in other people's sleep. So I'll try and reverse that tonight. Now, our topic is an immense one. Has science buried God? I know we're running late. I'll try and keep within the confines of my time limit because I'm more interested, actually, in the questions you have to ask. So I'll do it in telegraphic style, in a sense. My answer to the question is no. <laughs> but that's not the end of the story. Because I'm going to suggest rather provocatively tonight that science and God sit very comfortably together. The problem is fitting science with atheism. So let's see what we can do with this. First of all, it's obvious, it should be, that the real problem doesn't lie in the widespread idea that science and belief in God are incompatible. Take the Nobel Prize for Physics. Last year, won by Peter Higgs. He's a, an atheist and a brilliant physicist. A few years before that, it was won by a man called Bill Phillips, an American. And he's a Christian. And it's pretty obvious, isn't it, that they're not divided by their physics. They're equally brilliant physicists. They have different worldviews. And what I want to suggest to you tonight is there's a real conflict, but it's not at the level of science versus religion. Not really. It's at a much deeper level, a worldview level. And it goes back a very long time. If you go back to the ancient Greeks, you had Democritus and Leucippus, brilliant people, the atomists, who had the idea that ultimate reality consisted of atoms and empty space. And as the atoms cascaded through empty space, they produced galaxies and worlds and life and us and so on. At the same time, there were people like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, who said, no, there's something more, there's transcendence, there are the gods, there is God. And so barreling upwards from the ancient world into the 21st century academy, we have two polar opposite worldviews. There are others, but for tonight they will do. There's the materialist worldview, the reductionist worldview that everything can be reduced in the end to physics and chemistry and the laws of nature. And then there's a worldview that says, no, there is more, there is transcendence. There is a creator who created the world and holds it in being. And there are representatives of those two worldviews in most academies, except that in some Western countries, the atheistic worldview has prevailed to such an extent that it's regarded as the default. Now, the fascinating thing, and we can precise the question, because it has always fascinated me that the shift from Newton to Hawking really tells us what the whole business is about. You probably know that on the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, one of the most famous laboratories in the world, above the door, now both in Latin and English, it says a quotation from one of the ancient Psalms, great are the works of the Lord, delighted in by all those who research them. James Clark Maxwell put it there. And the fascinating thing is that the founders of modern science not only had no problem with faith in God, it was their faith in God that drove their science. C.S. Lewis put it brilliantly when he said, men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. So, in one sense, let me put it quite bluntly, because if you're mainly business people, you like the bottom line. Um, I'm not remotely ashamed of being a scientist and a Christian because arguably Christianity gave me my subject. And that's where the problem comes from. How is it that Isaac Newton was driven and Kepler and Galileo and Clark Maxwell and so on were driven by their faith in God and now Stephen Hawking tells us occupying, or he did until recently, Newton's chair in Cambridge, and a genius, if ever there was one, just ahead of me at Cambridge, and light years ahead of me in his brain power, he says we've got to choose between science and God. So what I want to do is use these two famous scientists as poles to develop one or two theses as how that shift has happened. 
Newton believes in God. It drives his science. And when he discovered his law of gravity and other things, he wrote the most brilliant book in the history of science, the Principia Mathematica, expressing in it explicitly the hope that it would cause a thinking person to believe in a deity. Whereas Stephen Hawking uses the same law of gravity to argue there isn't a God at all. And in his book, The Grand Design, he says because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. And uses that as an argument to do away with God. So here's the same law of gravity used in two diametrically opposite directions. Now that fascinates the logician in me. How is it that that can possibly happen? Many young people I meet, and older people as well, say, look, if Stephen Hawking says there's no God, who am I to contradict him? Well, let me suggest one or two uh, things that we can think about. I used to think that the problem lay in confusion about the nature of science. It does partly, as I'll go on to say. But I've come to the conclusion that it's also partly to do with confusion about the nature of God. That may surprise some of you, but you see, when I was young and I talked about God, people would automatically understand that I was talking about the triune God of the Bible. But now, of course, it's not so. And it suddenly occurred to me that when I talk about God in the Oxford Union or somewhere in a debate, many people think that the God I believe in is a kind of Greek God of lightning. So you postulate a God behind lightning because you don't understand it, and then you do a class in atmospheric physics at uh, UMIST here, and the Greek God of lightning disappears in lecture number one. That God of the gaps idea, I can't explain it, therefore God did it. Now, you see, the interesting thing about that is, if you think, as many of these leading people appear to do, that God, the God that I believe in as a Christian, is a God of the gaps, then of course you have to choose between God and science. It's logically obvious, because that's the way you've defined God. You've defined God as the X that holds the space until science fills it. So you've got to choose between God and science. The problem lies in the fact that the God of the Bible is not a God of the gaps. The Bible does not start with the words, in the beginning God created the bits of the universe we don't understand. <laughs> it starts with, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the whole show, the bits we do understand, the bits we don't. And interestingly, Newton, the more he understood, the more he admired the genius of the God who'd done it that way. That's the way we react. The more you understand about engineering, the more you can see in a Rolls-Royce engine. The more you understand about art, the more you can see in a Rembrandt. It's the more you understand, the more you admire the genius of the person that did it that way. And so that puts paid to that kind of God of the gaps argument, but it's holding up the whole discussion because people do not make clear that when they talk about God, they are not speaking about an X that fills a scientific space that will one day be taken over by science. But there's more to be explored in the other direction. So a false idea of God is part of the problem. A false notion of scientific explanation is another part of the problem. Why is the water boiling? Well, it's boiling because uh, its molecules are being agitated by heat energy from the flame of the cooker, and they're getting more and more vibrant, and steam's beginning to rise, and that's why it's boiling from the heat exchange. Not at all. It's boiling because I would like a cup of tea. <laughs> now, I'm glad you laugh, because it shows you see that those explanations do not conflict or contradict. I said not at all. That's a ridiculous statement. The explanations in terms of my intention and desire to have a cup of tea do not compete or conflict with the scientific explanation. They complement it. Now, that is so elementary. I find school kids can understand it perfectly, but I find that some of my colleagues can't because they think that if you've got a scientific level explanation, there's no need or there's no possibility of another level. And sometimes I put it this way, God no more competes with science 
in explaining the universe than Henry Ford competes with the law of internal combustion in explaining a motor car engine. It would be absurd to say we've two possible conflicting explanations of the motor car engine. One, the law of internal combustion and mechanical engineering, and the other, Henry Ford. They're different kinds of explanation, and so they don't compete. They complement. And that's a very elementary observation, yet again and again I meet this. If we've got a scientific explanation, that's the complete explanation. But it isn't not even within science. I was fascinated by the law of gravity as a boy. And I thought, and it puzzled me for a long time until somebody much better educated pointed out the problem, I thought it told me what gravity was. And I couldn't for the life of me see what gravity was. And then I discovered that nobody knows what gravity is, not even today. The law of gravity doesn't tell you what gravity is. It gives you a brilliant mathematical formulation that can land people on the moon even without Einstein's correction. It is a phenomenal insight. But as the philosopher Wittgenstein pointed out, he said, you know, the greatest delusion of modernism is that the laws of nature are explanations for the phenomena of nature. They're not. They're only descriptions of predictive power. And yet we think science explains that captures everything. It doesn't even capture everything within the disciplines of science itself. Multi-level explanation. Now, of course, we are persons in a universe that's got descriptions in terms of mathematical and physical laws and so on. It's a very complex universe. And if we're going to factor in any sort of big understanding of the universe, you have to bring in not only laws and descriptions of regularities, but you have to bring in intention and teleology and so on. That's our experience of life. Why shut it off when it comes to the really big questions? And you see... That mistake is made in that quote of Hawking that I gave to you. Because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself for nothing. When I first read that, and I was shown a preview of the book because one of the, our newspapers wanted me to respond, I read it again, I thought, come again? Because there is a law of gravity, because there is something, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. That's a flat contradiction. And then I thought, wait a minute, because there's a law of gravity, it doesn't say because gravity exists, but the law of gravity doesn't give you gravity. And that opens a window into a vast area of confusion. And that is that laws are creative. Uh, one of the reasons for the financial uh, crisis, ladies and gentlemen, was the belief that mathematics can create money. <laughs> creative accounting and so on. But C.S. Lewis pointed out long ago, you can add up from now to infinity, it'll never produce any money. I once had a discussion with Peter Atkins, who's one of our very famous atheists and a brilliant author of chemistry textbooks. And I said, Peter, what created the universe? And he said, mathematics. And I'm afraid I was so caught aback, I started to laugh rather impolitely. And he said, why are you laughing? Well, I said, Peter, quite honestly, I'm a mathematician, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. He said, why? Well, I said, one plus one equals two. Did that ever put two pounds in your pocket? <laughs> Some people think it could, but that's another story. You see, the laws of science, they're not even like the laws that lawyers deal with, and that's another part of the confusion. Because we talk about breaking laws and all this kind of thing. You might want to question me that as a scientist because at the heart of Christianity there is the claim, for instance, that Jesus rose from the dead. And the familiar view is that breaks the laws of nature so it couldn't happen. If you want to quiz me about that, you can. But I want to just proceed and get a few ideas into the um, arena of your thinking before I sit down. So here's the interesting thing. Hawking contradicts himself flat. And then he says, the universe can create itself. Well, let's analyze that. If I say to you, X creates Y, what does that mean? Well, roughly speaking, it means if you've got X, you'll get Y. 
If I say x creates x, what does that mean? Well, roughly speaking, it means if you've got x, you'll get x. And what does that mean? Well, in my book, it means nonsense remains nonsense, even if high-powered scientists are writing it. <laughs> it is absurd. And what I find so fascinating, and it's very interesting, because one of the biggest discoveries of the 20th century in astrophysics was that space-time has a beginning. Now, I know all sorts of modifications have to be made, but there are very high-powered mathematicians now, Guth, Vilenkin, and Bord, who argue that however many multiverses and so on you have, you still are backwards finite in time. It's bounded. There's a beginning of some absolute kind. So that leads to the big question, Leibniz's old question, how do you get something from nothing? Because if there was nothing, so long as you had an eternal universe, as they believed in for centuries, you'd no problem. But now, you've got to get something from nothing, and there's a huge cottage industry trying to do it. And one of the things I found very interesting is the lengths to which some scientists will go to do it. Let me give you a quote. What would you make of this? if you read it. Because something is physical, nothing must be physical, especially if you define it as the absence of something. What? That is a sentence by one of the world's leading astrophysicists in his attempt to get a universe from nothing. He's not achieving it. And I had the opportunity at Harvard MIT Faculty Club uh, last year to question the father of inflation. And I talked to him about this, uh, Alan Guth, and I said to him, Alan, when you physicists talk about nothing, you're not talking about nothing in the ordinary sense. No, we're not, he said. Well, I said, thank you very much. Now, that's a long story. You see, as a Christian, I don't believe the universe came from nothing. I believe it came from nothing physical, but I believe its existence was caused by God, who's not physical. God is spirit. Now, this brings me to another fascinating thing, a huge um, area, but I'm going to finish with this. And it goes like this. One of my main reasons for not being an atheist is because I can do science. That may strike you as very odd. But you see, ladies and gentlemen, it's fascinating that a mathematician can, in her mind here, Think up equations that seem to relate to the universe out there. Make sense of it. How does that work? Einstein was puzzled by this. The only incomprehensible thing about the universe, he said, is that it's comprehensible. Now, sometimes I have fun in Oxford. I must admit, I've still got the Irish sense of humor in me. So sometimes I talk to my colleagues and I say, tell me what you do science with. And they say, oh, we've just got a machine costing a million pounds. And no, no, I don't mean that. I mean this. Oh, you mean my, and they're about to say mind when they remember the current theories, and they say brain. I do science with my brain because many of my colleagues don't believe there's a mind. Well, okay, I do, but that's another story. Okay, tell me about the brain that you do science with. Do you want the long story or the short story? Short story, please. Well, you see, the brain is essentially the end product of a mindless, unguided process that didn't have it in mind. And I look at them and I say with a twinkle, and you trust it? <laughs> and you trust it? Who was the originator of that question? You'll be surprised, it was Charles Darwin. He said once, he said, you know, it troubles me, it puzzles me, how the human mind, how there's any validity to its thought, if, as I believe, it's descended from the mind of lower animals. After all, does a monkey have convictions in its mind, and would you trust them? Now, this has now moved into center stage in the debate. Not only from Christian philosophers with my viewpoint, no, 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 no. Just recently, Thomas Nagel, one of the world's leading philosophers in New York, has raised this question. And it's basically this, you see. What he's saying is this. If you can reduce everything step by step down to physics and chemistry, you destroy meaning and rationality. You undermine any basis for the rationality you need to do science or to conduct any argument whatsoever. Now, this is utterly fascinating to me. You see, what we're pushing at here is the view that mass energy is the ultimate reality, but it isn't, is it? Because we've lived to see the information age, 
an information now many physicists recognize to be a fundamental quantity that's not reducible to mass energy. And the thing about information is, although it usually has material carriers, it is not material. So the irony of 21st century science is we're now coming to a space where we have to consider the non-material as fundamental. And of course, that's the end of materialism. And you see, this idea that we can reduce all things to simpler bits of physics and chemistry is wonderful. It works in many areas. And my final point is there's one area where it does not work at all. And that's where language is concerned. I once met a brilliant scientist, and I'll not name him, but he was very concerned at sitting with me at a meal because he thought we'd nothing to talk about. Firstly, because I was a pure mathematician, that was boring. And secondly, because I believed in God. So I said, let's do an experiment. And he said, what's the experiment? Well, we picked up the menu from the dinner table and it said roast chicken on it. He said, what's the problem? That's roast chicken. I said, how do you know? I said, those are only marks on paper. Oh, but he said it says roast chicken. But how do you know? Well, I've learned English and so on. Okay. I said, you're a reductionist. He said, absolutely. Everything can be reduced to physics and chemistry. So I said, okay, have a go at this. You explained to me the semiotics of those marks, the way they carry meaning in terms of the physics and chemistry of the paper and ink. His wife was sitting beside him, and rather too loudly she said, get out of that if you can. <laughs> but you know, he was so honest, and his answer stunned me. He said, John, I've been trying to do that, and I believed it could be done for 40 years. But he said, so obviously can't. It's not within the explanatory power of physics and chemistry to give you meaning. And he looked at me for a long time and it suddenly dawned on me that he was concerned that I might be clever enough to have thought of the argument myself. He said, where did you get the argument? I said, from a Nobel Prize winner. Oh, he said, what a relief, what a relief. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, this is very important. You have only to see your name written on the sand or a few letters up on a blackboard and you immediately infer upwards to the involvement of intelligence. I then pushed that biochemist, and I said, you study DNA, don't you? That's a long word, isn't it? Three and a half billion letters in a four-letter chemical code. What's the origin of that, ultimately? Oh, he said, chance and necessity. I said, what? Chance and the laws of nature? He said, yes. I said, half a minute. You just saw roast chicken. R-O-A-S-T, five letters, and you immediately infer mind, and you watch three and a half billion letters in exactly the right order, and you say, chance and necessity. Something's going on. Of course it is. Because, you see, the design inference that lies on the surface has got to be resisted if your worldview is that of a naturalist. But it could be that the worldview is wrong. And you see, ladies and gentlemen, as I tried to think about these things, I see these two worldviews. In the beginning was mass energy, if you like, and it produces everything, including our minds and the idea of God, because there isn't a God. The alternative worldview goes like this. In the beginning was the word. Logic, information, energy. And the word was with God, or the word was God. All things came to be through him. And without him, nothing came to be that came to be. And I'm faced with those two worldviews. And as a scientist, not simply as a Christian, it makes infinitely more sense to me to believe that what is behind our universe is word-based and not simply particle-based. Thank you very much. <laughs>